The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, this is Bring Your Own PC. I am Ben Francis, and this is the 9th of June, 2013, at Southeast Linux Fest. And we got a nice, cozy group here, so uh, we can tailor the, de the presentation to what uh, Roger wants to hear. <laughs> and your name, sir? Klaatu. Klaatu. Klaatu? Okay, and uh, to what uh, Klaatu wants to, uh, wants to hear also. So, BYOPC. Um, maybe I misnamed this uh, presentation because it's, it's, maybe it should be uh, Bring Your Own Laptop because that's really who it's uh, tailored for. Um, and what, uh, what got me thinking about this is that I've been doing um, net booting for a long time uh, for the military um, and uh, I've recently retired from the military, work at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield right now. Just started with them, uh, but the net booting is my specialty, and I started thinking about this, and I said, well, you know, for large organizations that want to um, <clears throat> protect their information uh, and also protect their employees for, um, and, and protect their own infrastructure from stuff that employees want to bring in, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult trick. Um, and Gartner just came out with uh, uh, an article just a uh, like a month ago or a couple weeks ago, saying that most uh, corporations are going, or the majority of corporations are, go are going to require bring your own device by 2017. Who knows if that's going to play out, but the idea is out there, and I thought, well, you know, this is, this is one way to do bring your own device, and uh, this, uh, so um, I'm going to show that, uh, and I'm not, uh, H. Peter An Anvin or any of the great other great uh, net booters out there, but I have figured out how to how to boot from a web server, and uh, and I'm going to show you that here t here today, and j just the the solution that I've figured out. Um, the reason for why a company would like to like you to bring your own laptop to work is obviously because they don't have to pay for it. Uh, but they do have to worry about the viruses that you're going to bring into the workplace, uh, especially if you run Windows. But I, but I'm, uh, I don't have a drummer. He, he should, uh, that would have been where he does that. <laughs> um, and uh, so, but first of all, employees like their own laptops, and if they're power users, uh, like the people in this room, that you, you're going to be running your favorite operating system and. You really don't want to have to switch back to a nut, the work, the work laptop or the work desktop just, just to get your work done uh, because it is kind of a, uh, a mental thing when you're having to switch and go into work mode and then you know, s switch and go back to your, uh, to your laptop. Um, I can get anything done mode. Okay, so the PXC has a, has a history. What is it? PXC stands for Pre-Boot Execution Environment. Uh, it was a specification invented by Intel in the late 90s. Uh, and the initial um, implementations of PXC uh, left a lot to be desired. Um, the, the main part being that their, their TFTP implementations were all buggy and sometimes they, just, they, they would work on some devices and not work on others. And, and it, was just, it was just kind of a big mess. Um, so, uh, and, and it was a it was, it was an open specification, but everybody implemented it in a proprietary way. So, it, it left a lot to be desired for you know. Oh, we, we just we're just going to design this to work on just on our, our our chipset and our laptop and you know nobody else's, so we don't have to worry about everybody else. Well, uh, that led to Etherboot.org or the Etherboot project. Um, Etherboot has its own open source um, project to, 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 to manage all this stuff, and that, that led to GPXC. GPXC is the open source version of PXE. 
or pre-boot execution environment. Um, this is what this this is the uh, the version the version of the program that loads right after right after the BIOS runs. Um, so it grew out of the Etherboot project and gave us a whole whole lot of new protocols that uh, that we can use. Um, protocols like HTTP, uh, iSCSI, um, AOE, um, uh, what else? Uh, a fiber channel. Uh, all this stuff came out of the, G, uh, G, GP, uh, the GPXE project. Uh, so uh, it allows you to boot from uh, a web server like I'm going to show you. Not only that, but you could boot off a, 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 a storage area network uh, and support all the machines that you want. OK, so a little bit about the, the Pogo plug that, that you see on the, on the desk over there. Um, I'll just, I don't have any wires. So I'll show you what the Pogo plug is. This is the Pogo plug, and I'll get back into camera view, so in case the camera was just on me. Um, that is just a $25 box I bought on Amazon. Um, it used to be the version of the Pogo plug before the, the, the pink one came out. but I happened to get lucky, and, and that one actually has the uh, Ferocian E02 processor in, which is the normal processor for most of the pink uh, Pogo plugs. So, you know, so sometimes you get lucky. They were just channel stuffing, and, and uh, I just happened to get lucky and, and got a good, uh, good machine. But anyway, that machine is running Arch Linux. Arch Linux is a, a distribution of Linux tailored for Small machines, uh, just enough to get you by, and of course uh, modular and allows you to load a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, the the package manager that comes with Arch is called Pacman, um, and it, it works a lot like Yum and uh, AppGet uh, on the on the Debian side uh, or Aptitude. So uh, uh, it, so it's very good uh, distribution to work with. Uh, you have to SSH into the uh, into the box to to operate it because obviously it doesn't have a doesn't have a monitor or anything. Uh, it's just got an Ethernet port and four USB uh, four USB ports and, and that's it. Sir, I'm sorry. I'm going to cover that. Uh, yes, great question. Um, to to answer it right off the bat, <clears throat> GPixie is is chain loaded from the, the regular PXE distribution on your lap on, on, on a laptop. So you could have GPXE just on a ROM card. Say I, I could burn it to this laptop right here. But let's say let's say I don't want to take that risk. You know, I know Pixie works with this laptop right here. There's a there's a technique called chain loading where you can tell the laptop to say, okay, boot from the network, because I know you got PXE, and then the network says Oh, you got PXE. You need iPixie, which is uh, okay. I, uh, GPXE. I, I thought I had a slide for it, but I don't. But the next slide should have been should have said iPixie and said iPixie is the new G, GPXE. GPXE hasn't been updated since 2011. Has had one one commit in actually in, in exactly two years, uh, and all the developers from GPXE. Have gone to iPixie, and the reason is is social. Um, the the person that owns Etherboot.org and and GPXE.org, um, he doesn't want to give anything up, and he and he's very he's apparently he's a very controlling type person. So now it's iPixie. Yes, sir. Chain loading. Yes, it's a chain loader. So PXE loads iPixie. Um, and then iPixie loads and says, "Okay, the real. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna get into it." And we saw that about the Pogo plug. All right, yeah, here we go. The network boot process. So, plug it in the laptop. You change your BIOS to boot from the network. Um, uh, usually, your laptop is not is configured to boot from. Probably the CD first, and then and then the hard drive. You want to change the order of that to say uh, um, there'll be a LAN boot at the bottom or a PXE boot. Uh, uh, different manufacturers call it a different different thing, but just make sure that 
uh, your, your bio says uh, boot from the, the network before the hard drive or else it's going to load um, Linux or Windows or whatever operating system you have on the hard drive. Um, okay, so PXE starts, the, the, in this case the old Pixie from um, the old Pixie proprietary one that came with a laptop. It asks for a DHCP server because it doesn't, it doesn't know, it, all it knows is that it's got a MAC address and that's it. So it says, I, I need an IP address and, DH, and the DHCP server that you have configured says, oh, you need iPixie. Um, and then it gives it iPixie and then it loads that. iPixie loads up and then says, uh, the DHCP server says, uh, okay, what do you want? And he says, well, I need an operating system. iPixie says, okay, well, you need VM Linux. And then it, it does a little switch and, you know, here we go. How does it know? Um, the DHCP server is the one that decides. It says, if, you're, if you don't have iPixie, I'm going to give you iPixie. If you have iPixie, then load VM Linux and this initial uh, RAM disk. And this is exactly how it looks on, on the boot line, too. Uh, if you're running Grub, it'll say initRD, it'll say load VM Linux, and then the initRD line specifying the initial RAM disk will have root equals dev RAM, RAM disk block size is 4096, and then the RAM disk size is some huge number. In this case, it's 300, uh, 340 megabyte RAM disk size. And that's needed because uh, that, that last line right there was the magic sauce that got me over the hump and, and actually got this version of Linux to, to load. Um, and I've been playing with this for a couple years now. Um, so that's the magic sauce right there. DNS mass, uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit because you have to have a TFTP server and, uh, and a web server, okay? Um, uh, and a, D a DHCP server. Uh, DNS mass actually functions as both a TFTP server, a DHCP server, and a DNS cacher. So all that stuff is loaded right on the, uh, the Pogo plug in, in Arch Linux itself. Um, and we're going to see how this uh, shakes out in the demo that I'm going to do. So DNS mass is a, is a very nice uh, implementation of uh, com combining two technologies that, that you're going to need. Um, it's probably not robust enough for booting 1,000 clients at the same time. So in, in that case, you would have to use uh, a, a TFTP server that, by H. Peter Anvin called uh, TFTP-HPA. HPA is standing for H. Peter Anvin. Um, uh, but there's also a way you could do it with a Microsoft uh, DHCP server also. It's, it's a different set of procedures. Um, all right, so that's how you boot from the network. Now, if you're not inside your network, how is that going to work if you're at a hotel room or something and you, and you say, well, you know, I really like that, that, that setup that work gave me uh, for you know, just having a, a, a real light distribution that I can use to, to browse the web and not worry about security or anything like that. How, how would you manage that? Well, in that case, you would give, um, your employee a CD or a USB stick that uh, you have boot that has the same VM Linux and the same initial RAM disk, uh, but it's on the US. It was just it's just on the USB. And in this case, since you've loaded the all the instructions for you know whether he's got you, you've already loaded iPixie on the USB, you don't have to do that uh, DACP trick where you switch from PXE to iPixie. So. <clears throat> um, let's see, did I cover all that? iPixie is already on it. Uh, you boot the computer from the thumb drive and, and the computer gets a, gets a boot files from the company's web server. The computer gets the boot files from the company web server. So you can have your company's, you know, play distribution for just going and accessing the web. You could have it on Linode somewhere, uh, somewhere in the cloud. Uh, as long as it's a web server and you've got those two files, VMLess and, and the initial RAM disk, on that web server, it's going to find it because you've told this USB stick that it's at uh, you know, 
21.68. Uh, and, and it will find it. So this, this is a good way to give a, a, a USB thumb drive or, or a CD to your employees. Say, okay, if you want to surf securely and make sure that none of your stuff is getting to the hard drive and none of the, none of the viruses on the, on the hotel's um, desktop computer is getting to your USB stick, this is the way to do it. Okay, uh, yeah, the references, where did I get all this stuff? Uh, I got a whole bunch of it from ipixie.org, which was the old gpxe.org. Uh, the the NetBootMe people are, are great. They, they came out in about 2009 with a, a, a distribution based on, um, based on the kernel.org, uh, boot.kernel.org people. Um, John Wardhog9 Holly was uh, uh, one of the main instigators behind that effort. Uh, unfortunately, his, uh, the, the kernel.org server got hacked uh, last, last year and, and, and it's dead, dead, dead right now. Um, so that's why I don't have them up there, otherwise I would mention them. But if you went to boot.kernel.org right now, it'd, it'd be just, I don't know, I don't know what that is. Yeah. SPI.DOD.mil is the distribution that we're going to load right now. Um, it's, it is a DOD website, but they publicly publish a version of Linux that everybody can use. Uh, and it's pretty cool. It's a small distribution of Linux, about, you know, when I started with it, it was about 130 megabytes, and now it's about, it's a little over 200 now, but it still loads in a decent amount of time over a gigabit network that you wouldn't, no, you wouldn't notice it from a regular hard drive boot. And you're going to see that when we, when we do the demo right here. Um, coreboot.org is notable for, um, they are the people that are creating open source boot firmware to replace the proprietary BIOSes and the proprietary UEFI firmware that is currently coming out with, uh, with uh, today's laptops. Uh, in, in fact, uh, there's been a lot of discussion that, you know, is, is Microsoft using UEFI to try to lock uh, Linux distributions out of being loaded on a, on a, on a regular laptop. Um, uh, and, and that is the case with, with many laptops that are coming out there right now. So core boot is an effort to kind of sidestep that and say, okay, let's just have everything out in the open instead of having proprietary BIOSes and proprietary UFIs loading to open operating systems. Let's just start, you know, from, let's start open from square one. And that's what core boot is all about. Okay, so let's. Uh, I want to. Ooh, hey, ooh, hey. That's the end of the PowerPoint stuff. So, and I want to be able to configure this. Uh, I got a crazy laptop where I can't see the pointer. Okay, here we go. I'm going to try to mirror the display settings so that you can see exactly what I'm seeing. This will come back in a second. And then we'll go ahead and... <coughs> Do we want to keep it? Yes. All right. Good. Good. Bye-bye. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this laptop right here as the test laptop. So all this stuff in the presentation is going to go away. This is Harper. He was a, the tech, chief technology op, officer for the, uh, um, for the Obama, the re-elect Obama campaign. Uh, sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, but he gave one heck of an awesome demonstrate, uh, presentation at POSCON a couple months ago in Colombia, and so, you know, get rid of the politics and everything. What this guy had to do uh, to, 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 get, to get the Obama campaign, get the word out, uh, it was just amazing. He hired 50 developers in, four, in, in three months. Uh, and, and, you know, I asked him, well, how, how in the world did you make sh sure one of those guys wasn't a mole? And he said, uh, I hired from friends. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, all right, that's one way to do it. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm a big fan of his, obviously. I got his mug on my desktop. But let's go ahead and, um, and do the rebooting, and we will see how our little tiny little web server uh, can serve as uh, uh, how we can boot from a web server. So shut down, restart. Uh, I guess I did. I must have. Uh, yeah, cancel. Cancel. Oh, we started up another one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Forget that. Discard. Well, you know, thank you, Ubuntu, for not telling me exactly what's going on. All right. Restart again. Yes, I really do want to restart. OK, good. So what we're expecting here is for the, the, the PXE version that came with the laptop to load. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to chain load right into uh, the iPixie version of a, of a preboot execution environment. Here we go. It's on my laptop, you're not seeing it? Oh, there you go. OK, so down at the bottom here, you can see it loaded boot.php. PH, it, it's just a, a web file that has two, uh, it has a little menu in it that says, OK, go ahead and load VM Linux and then load uh, the initial RAM disk. Um, and you can see the, the initial RAM disk is, is kind of a huge file. It's like 200 megabytes. Uh, it's greater than 200 megabytes. And it's loading pretty quickly. I mean, this is. This is about what you would expect from a hard drive. Okay, now here's the fun stuff. Here's Linux all loading. Quick, 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 fast, fast, fast. Redo X. All right, here we go. And bam. Okay, we're here. Just say yes to the user agreement. And this is lightweight portable security from, uh-oh, uh, there we go. Okay, here we go. This is lightweight portable security from the DOD, Department of Defense. Um, the part, DOD is almost exclusively a, a Windows shop on, on the Army side anyway. Uh, the Navy plays a lot with Linux, and, and this is actually a product of the Air Force. They have a small little lab that says, OK, we're going we're gonna to see what we can do with Linux. Uh, and this is one of the distributions they've done. And it's kind of neat. Um, they, instead of a window, they, they made it on a Windows theme right here. I'm going to get the cursor over here. And instead of the Windows logo, they replaced it with a penguin. Uh, it's hard, hard to see from back there. Sorry, Jeremy. Um, but uh, a couple of features that are, are, are notable is it's got a little encryption wizard. Um, pull that up. And you can drag, drag and drop files in here. Um, and it'll do the encrypting for you. Um, Another major feature of this distribution of Linux is that it doesn't have any drivers in it whatsoever that, that talk to hard drives, OK? Um, so even if you wanted you know, to hack on a hard drive or something, it would be impossible because it just, it just doesn't have the drivers. That's what keeps the, uh, the, the distribution lean and mean. Um, it's based on a version of uh, ThinStation 2.2.2.1, uh, I believe. Um, then station came out uh, about uh, 2005. It's 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 a good good old distribution, uh, very configurable, uh, and uh, it's 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 a hacker distribution. But this one I didn't have to hack at all. All I did was 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 get the uh, the CD image for for lightweight portable security. Um, uh, pull it up in a uh, it was just the ISO file. Uh, pull it up in an archive uh, manager. Um, saw the two files for VM Linux and the initial RAM disk, and just said, OK, what happens if I take those things out and put them on the network and see if I can boot from them? Well, the, the, the short story is that I couldn't at, at first until I figured out that I needed to make the, the initial RAM disk size a lot larger than um, you know, 10 megabytes or whatever, whatever the initial value was, because it, it, it wasn't, it definitely wasn't like in the 130 meg uh, uh, RAM disk that I was pulling down or trying to pull down at the time. 
As soon as I uh, bump that up to uh, 300 meg as a, as, a, as a RAM disk size, then everything's running swimmingly. Um, notice also that this kind of a distribution is running entirely in RAM. Um, no swap, no nothing like that. It's just all running in RAM. So it's, it's as fast as a, as a distribution can run. Um, and you got your, you got your Firefox, uh, normal stuff. There is a, a, a version of this distribution that has OpenOffice with it also, uh, but also that, that, that causes the files to get uh, bigger by about 100 and, oh, about 150 megabytes. So um, I chose, I just chose the, the lighter one in case, uh, 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 just to make the presentation shorter. Okay, so um, that is enough about lightweight portable security. Uh, again, it was, built, it was built off of thin station, so if you wanted to do something like this in your organization as, uh, you know, I, I just want to web, uh, uh, be able to give my employees a, a web browser and maybe a small, uh, or oh, shoot, I want to give them open office and, and all that, then you could do that. It's just uh, enabling options in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the thin station uh, configuration file. So with that, um, I, I like to have a, allow, allow a lot of time for questions, so I'm going to stop presenting and start asking you all what, uh, what questions you have. Sir. It, it's, it's not that easy. Um, the ISO has two files. Uh, in this case, the ISO had two files with it. One was VM Linux, which was uh, a compressed version of the Linux kernel. Okay? Uh, and then the other one was the initial RAM disk, uh, initRD. Um, the initRD has all the device drivers that the system administrator believes are important, the one that compiled ThinStation that he thought were important to be able to put in to, in, into the RAM disk to be able to support as many machines as possible. So there's drivers in there for, you know, Realtek. There's drivers in there for, um, you know, E1000 Intel cards. There's, you know, um, and it's, it's also a way to, to, to make your, your distribution of Linux more secure because if, if you knew that your organization only has Intel E1000 cards, then you could leave all those other drivers out and say, we're only supporting Intel E1000s. And you know, if, if somebody brings in uh, uh, a guy with, a, with an unsupported card, you could, um, you could configure the BIOS to say, hey, your card doesn't, uh, uh, is, is, doesn't work here, and, and you've got to you know, get one of our machines. Does that answer your question? OK. Sir. It's already got iPixie loaded on it. So you, ha um, so you have taken this uh, version. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. You're, you've, you've configured iPix iPixie to say, um, this is exactly where the web server is. This is the IP address. Uh, it doesn't have to be an IP address. It could be you know, something off leno.com. Uh, uh, wherever your server in the cloud is, um, and yeah, your, US, your USB stick says that we're definitely using iPixie, and, and that is where your initial boot files are. It gives you the HTTP protocol. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions? I have not worked with. Uh, uh, the question was: uh, Have I seen support for iPixie in Cobbler? And I, I haven't messed with that software at all. So I'll, I'll just put it out to the group. Has anybody else seen? Support for it in Cobbler? No. 
Uh, is Cobbler kind of like Puppet or? A pixie, okay, cobbler's a pixie provisioning tool. I, you would think I would know that. <laughs> um, but no, um, I, I, haven't, I haven't messed with that one at all. Sorry. Um, okay, so uh, I want to hold you up if you want to get to any other presentations or. Can you show us the Roger? interface for the router? The interface for the router? Sure. <laughs> this is an almond router. Um, it has, uh, it, it's, it's the first router with a, a graphical display that you can um, touch and configure the router just by you know, touching the, the router itself instead of having to uh, go to a, a web administration page or something like that. Yeah. Where would you go to put them? Okay, good question. So I think I can. Um, on your web server, I'll, I'll just an answer it quickly and try to get to it later. Uh, on your web server, you're going to have uh, a, a directory for your HTTP root, and then under there, uh, in this, this example, I've got a folder called L LPS, and inside LPS is just two files. It's VM Linux and the initial RAM disk, which I had built from the, uh, the ThinStation package. Um, so instead of having, um, you, could, you could just have another folder. Let's say you wanted uh, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You could just have uh, the VM Linux and, and whatever uh, initial RAM disk comes with that in a separate folder for, you know, R-H-E-E-L. You just want to do, just basically get something to your WWW, HDOC, wherever your web and the rest of the data just kind of sits in, inside this other folder, like LPS or whatever? The, the whole library system oh, is sitting in those two files. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's it's pretty impressive to you know load a whole Aubrey system from from two files from a web server, um, and and that's why the reason I got interested in in the first place. Um, Linux is small enough and light enough to, uh, as a kernel to be able to just you know live out that modular promise and say, well, I don't need all this stuff. I just need you know uh, a decent array of network cards, uh, maybe Open Office and a web and a web browser, and hey. That's all I need for my employees, right? Or in, in this case, you know, well, let's give you the encryption wizard too, and let's let's give your employees some security by not loading all kinds of disk drivers, and you know, allowing them to get viruses that way. Now, can you get a can you still get a virus with LPS uh, in in this setup? Yes, uh, but the virus is living in is living in ram and you would uh, you could solve it just by turning the computer off and rebooting but, but well if you've been to some of the other security uh uh talks here uh viruses are getting sneakier and sneakier and and they're figuring out ways to get in the ram uh also so you know maybe that's a bigger consideration than it used to be but most system administrators in the past would, would be happy, you know, as ducks in a pond, to just be able to turn off a computer and reboot it and everything be fine. <clears throat> okay, so any other questions? All right, well, I, I hope I've uh, communicated the power of uh, Linux uh, booting over a network from a, a web server. The web server doesn't have to be uh, a monster web server or nothing. You can see the Pogo plug right there is 256 meg machine running on a Ferocian uh, processor, which is uh, um, Arch, uh, based on Arch Linux ARM. But there's nothing special it does other than have a web server. <laughs> Actually, that little box is running NTP um, and it's got Postfix on it. <laughs>
I would say that you could run it, and, and I have run it from a decently slow router, or a, a, I mean, I specialize in 10-year-old boxes because I get a lot of them donated to me, and I, I, I put Linux on them, give them to you know, people that need them, uh, generally you know, poor members of the... There you go, yeah, broken hard drives, I don't care, just give me a CPU and a network card, right? So, you know, you can just take your broken laptop, s screw it to your, uh, to your uh, coffee table and, uh, <laughs> you know, boot from the network and not worry about uh, your friends uh, screwing anything up. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so we've gone about 45 minutes and... Um, I want to give my friend, uh, uh, I forgot your name, time to set up. Yeah, okay. So thank you for listening, and come back to self next year. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today 
regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system. We can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power 
from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.